Which one? Yeah, I'll play it. You got it. Father, we just, we just thank you for another Sabbath day that, that you've brought us here together. We, we thank you so much for giving us brethren, for giving us brothers and sisters that we can, we can meet with in the flesh, that we're so blessed. We know so many of our brethren struggle in the world, and they, they don't have this, this, this precious gift. We thank you so much for your word and how you always revive us every week. You always always renew us and set us apart and give us what we need for the next week and and you you work in our lives with each other and and we, we just thank you so much that you show up and that you care so much for us we we long to be closer to you and we thank you for giving us people to share in this common struggle with that we we just we strive to desire intimacy with you and we don't choose you first all the time and we thank you that you somehow can continue to renew your, your grace every day. We thank you so much for that, Lord, and we just ask that your, that your way would be done here, that, that everything would be directed by you and not by us and, and we would just be just willing vessels to receive and, and to bless and be blessed and that ministering would be done in both ways, Lord pray that you would be pleased with your people today. In Jesus' name, amen. Turn number six in your hymnal. Just to take him at his word. 
Hallelujah. May the Lord be blessed today. You know, I was reflecting this week. I was talking with Sarah some and thinking about, I guess it probably might have started with Shane's testimony last Sabbath. I was thinking about the different people the Lord has brought here and the different ways he works and how he's used different things to bring people here, bring people to himself. And it got me reflecting on my testimony and essentially how the Lord saved me and how I ended up here. And many of you are already familiar with that, but even for me personally, I think it was good to reflect on it and remember that essentially it was the Lord's presence. It was worship and experiencing Him personally close to close by the manifestation of his presence that saved me, that took me from a place where, you know, I was raised in the same faith that Pastor and David, you know, have talked about where it was very much about uh, God's standard and caring about his truth. We kept the Sabbath and the holy days and, you know, I always knew there was a God and a right and a wrong and was pretty acquainted with his ways as a child, and honestly, I always had, I was brought up with a uh, fear and a respect for authority, so I was always really scared of going to hell, essentially. I, uh, I wanted to escape that, but, and so I knew one day when I could get over my flesh, it would be right that I should be baptized, but I never really had a desire to. I never had a, uh, desire for for the Lord himself in that way until 2006 when my family came uh, to keep the feast here in, uh, at Camp Beaver Fork. And it was at that feast through, through this body and the willingness and diligence here, the leadership here to pursue the Lord's presence above all else, to worship him and give him the praise that he deserves, the praise that he inhabits. That's when I really, it was experiencing that, experiencing his manifest presence and the power that is there that had me realize, that caused me to realize that I couldn't go another day, I couldn't go any longer without him, that he was where it was at. It wasn't about, you know, perfectly obeying and keeping a, a, a standard so that you could save yourself or at that it was it was coming face to face with him that put everything in perspective to with the fleshly desires that that doesn't matter anymore whereas before I may have had um, hopes and dreams and things that I might accomplish or stuff I might care about before before surrendering my life at that point it did not matter anymore and that was because of the power of his presence. And since that feast, and I haven't done this perfectly, but since that moment, nothing has ever mattered to me more. Nothing has ever come close to rivaling that pursuit and the value therein. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't times where 
we wane and we, we get distracted and kind of burdened with struggles and life and things can get in the way, you know? And so, honestly, the point of the message today is that it's important to have a reminder. It's important to remember that nothing else matters more than that. It's important to renew a fire consistently because I'm sure you all would agree that, you know, as years go on that things, things come up, you know, and, and we, we just wane in intensity and we get distracted and, and, you know, we've heard before the devil will do everything that he can to get our mind on anything else. He'll use work and being busy and having a baby perhaps. Um, you know, or trials or things that you're struggling with. He'll use condemnation and sin. Like, whatever he can do, he will do it to distract us because he knows there's nothing more powerful than us walking step by step with the Lord, us being in his very presence, full of him every day. You know, and that's what we've kind of been come to be known for in, in this body. And I'm so thankful for that. Um, it's been prophesied over us that, you know, we're to be a people of his presence, that it's a new thing the Lord desired to do with us, you know, and that's, that's what we're primarily about as a church. We worship in spirit and in truth. We care about doing everything the Lord says as best we can and keeping his commandments and preaching the gospel, but we're about him first, you know. I'll never forget a sermon a few years ago that Pastor gave where, he essentially said, what are you about? And what would others say that you're about? Because when you're asked that question, sure, you'd like to say, well, yeah, I'm about pursuing the Lord and that what matters most. That's the right answer. But anyone that knows us, is that what they would say about us? Is there anything that we find in the way, anything that we find distracting us or keeping us from that purpose? You can go ahead and turn to Hebrews chapter 9. Starting in verse 1, it says, Now even the first covenant had regulations of divine worship and the earthly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle prepared, the outer one, in which we were the lampstand and the table and the sacred bread. This is called the holy place. And behind the second veil there was a tabernacle which is called the holy of holies. Having a golden altar of incense and the ark of the covenant covered on all sides with gold and which was a golden jar holding the manna, and Aaron's rod which budded, and the tables of the covenant. And above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. But of these things we cannot now speak in detail. And now when these things have been so prepared, the priests are continually entering the outer tabernacle, performing the divine worship. But into the second, only the high priest enters once a year, not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the sins of the people, committed in ignorance. And the Holy Spirit is signifying this, that the way into the holy place has not yet been disclosed while the outer tabernacle is still standing, which is a symbol for the present time. Accordingly, both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make the worshiper perfect in conscience. And since they relate only to food and drink and various washings, regulations for the body, imposed until a time of reformation. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation. And not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood he entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. You know, when I was thinking this week about how nothing, we can't let anything get in the way and far be it from us to be more passionate about something else or to care about little things like the type of music it is or distractions about the, the work week or you know something that you're really excited about in the flesh. Like, to let any of that get in the way, I was thinking about how valuable a gift it is that we've been given to enter the Holy of Holies, that 
It cost Jesus his blood, his torn flesh, the veil that they're talking about before him. You know, I don't know that we think about this often because we've only ever lived since Jesus has come. But before Jesus, once a year, the high priest alone could go into the Lord's presence. And it was a very dangerous thing. He could go in with, I've heard, uh, with a rope tied around him in case he was killed so they could pull him back out. You know, it was a very weighty thing. And no one else had that privilege, that honor, until Jesus came. And we'll go ahead, hold your place here and turn to Matthew that veil that it talks about separating the Holy of Holies from the holy place, I've heard that it was as, could have been as high as 60 feet tall and as thick as four to six inches. You know, that's fabric we're talking. I don't even know how you weave fabric that thick, but I think that's probably denser and more sound than the walls in my house that are sheetrock. I mean, it's a great barrier between everyone and the Lord. And we find in chapter 27 of Matthew, verse 50, where it says, Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. With his death, he tore that barrier and he replaced, well, Let's go ahead and turn to chapter 10 in Hebrews. He tore that veil in two and then he replaced it with his own flesh. Chapter 10 and verse 19 says, Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus. And you know, over in chapter 9 where we just uh, read, it said that... Uh, the gifts and sacrifices offered cannot make the worshiper perfect in conscience. That before Jesus, you could not come to the Lord with a truly clean conscience. You couldn't, like he just wasn't attainable in that way without Jesus' sacrifice. And so now, with his sacrifice, with his blood covering us, we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus. By a new and living way which he inaugurated for us, through the veil that is his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith. You know, so we're commanded to draw near, to worship the Lord and to pursue him, to be close to him. And later in this chapter, it talks about how the Lord has no pleasure in those who shrink back. And whatever... Typically, I think I've always thought of shrinking back as uh, having an unclean conscience, having uh, a sin that uh, you know is nagging at us or something of that nature where we feel condemned. But you could shrink back for any number of reasons. You could shrink, shrink back because you're afraid to be that close to the Lord because it's uncomfortable to the flesh or because you're feeling condemned or simply because we let other things get in the way and we just don't consciously, intentionally, regularly make sure that passion and that fire is, is stirred up, that, that that's just important, you know? And then above all else, we care about the Lord being pleased with us. And so to know that if we shrink back that he has no pleasure in that, that that's just not acceptable. So let us draw near with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. And let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And I love that, that if we just hold fast to the confession of our hope, we know that Jesus is faithful. We put all of our confidence in him, in the fact that he is who he says he was, that he was raised from the dead, and that his blood, it makes us clean and acceptable to the Father to wear we can boldly come before his throne. It's such a gift and an opportunity that we have that we should never squander. Let's look at Exodus chapter 33. I've always loved Moses and King David as examples of how to really be about and how to care about the Lord's presence above all else. 
chapter 33 in Exodus, starting in verse 12. Preceding this, we have the people who have asked Aaron to make them an idol, a golden calf, and Moses comes down and he's angry for the Lord, and the Lord is so angry, he says, you know, I will, I'll send him to the promised land, but I'm sending an angel to lead you there. And, uh, and then we have Moses come. I love that it says God would speak face to face with Moses as a friend. You know, at, before Jesus, this was a very, very rare occurrence for someone like Moses to have that opportunity. But for us, it's, it's freely extended to us to be able to speak face to face with the Lord. And so Moses intercedes for the people and he says to the Lord, See, you say to me, bring up this people, but you yourself have not let me know whom you will send with me. Moreover, you have said, I have known you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now therefore I pray you, if I have found favor in your sight, let me know your ways that I may know you, so that I might find favor in your sight. Consider too that this nation is your people. And he said, My presence shall go with you, and I will give you rest. And then he said to him, If your presence does not go with us, do not lead us up from here. Moses has zero regard for entering the promised land without the Lord's presence. And they're in the middle of the wilderness, and they've been promised a land flowing with milk and honey, like it's essentially paradise. And Moses doesn't care about it at all. It's like he didn't care about the riches in Egypt. He just he, he cares about the Lord. And he says, if you don't go with us, then it doesn't matter. Just don't even send me. You might as well kill us here and now. For how then can it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not by your going with us so that we, I and your people, may be distinguished from all the other people who are upon the face of the earth? The Lord said to Moses, I will also do this thing of which you have spoken, for you have found favor in my sight, and I have known you by name. And then Moses said, I pray you, show me your glory. And so Moses gets what he's asking for. The Lord says, okay, I will go with you. And then he goes a step further. He's like, well, I want to see your glory now, which I just, I just love that that's, that's foremost on Moses' mind here. And he said, I myself will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show compassion on whom I will show compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face for no man can see me and live. And then the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and you shall stand there on the rock, and it will come about while my glory is passing by, that I will put you in the cleft of the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. And then I will take my hand away, and you will see my back, but my face shall not be seen. In Psalm 84, And so I read that and I wonder often how do we, how do I compare to Moses where he would, he's willing to give up the best that this life had to offer. He didn't want the promised land without the Lord. He only wanted to see the Lord's glory. You know, so by comparison, what is there that is in my life that I consider important enough to, to not pursue the Lord in that way to where nothing else matters Nothing else takes the forefront of your mind. Psalm 84, start in verse 1. It says, How lovely are your dwelling places, O Lord of hosts! My soul longed and even yearned for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. The bird also has found a house and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young. Even your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. How blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. Down to verse 8. It says, O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. Behold our shield, O God, and look upon the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand outside. You know, when you've experienced the Lord's presence, you know that to be true. I would, I would rather have one moment where I can feel his nearness, one moment to see him or to hear his voice than, 
than all the pleasures that this world could offer, than anything else. You know, the Lord says he's found by those who seek him, but it takes seeking. You know, and I know as a whole, we all, we want to see miracles and, and healings and things that come when the Spirit is moving, but I think really we, do, we want those things, we love those things because it's just the Lord being near, it's his power being manifest and, and him moving freely. We just, we always want him to experience him, to know that he's walking amongst us. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand outside. Now I would rather stand at the threshold of the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. And the Lord gives grace and glory. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, how blessed is the man who trusts in you. And you know, the language in the Psalms is, is beautiful, beautifully expressive in how my soul longs and yearns for the courts of the Lord. Or another translation renders that my soul faints, like it grows pale and like I cannot be sustained without your presence. Like that is, is what matters most to me. I believe it's Psalm 42 where David writes that as a deer pants for the water, so my soul longs for you. So it's just good for us to remember, remind ourselves regularly because the world, the devil, the flesh, it's just distracting. Remind ourselves regularly what matters most, what our soul really longs for. Hallelujah. Psalm 56, be gracious to me, O God, for man has trampled upon me. Fighting all day long, he oppresses me. My foes have trampled upon me all day long, for they are many who fight proudly against me. When I am afraid, I will put my trust in you. In God, whose word I praise, in God I have put my trust. I shall not be afraid. What can mere man do to me? All day long, they distort my words. All their thoughts are against me for evil. They attack, they lurk, they watch my steps, as they have waited to take my life. Because of wickedness, cast them forth, and anger put down the peoples, O God. You have taken account of my wanderings, put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? Then my enemies will turn back in the day when I call. This I know, that God is for me. In God whose word I praise, in the Lord whose word I praise, in God I have put my trust, I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? Your vows are binding upon me, O God. I will render thank offerings to you, for you have delivered my soul from death, indeed my feet from stumbling, so that I may walk before God in the light of the living.
number 46. Hey 
Fine. 
house of the Lord forever. We feel you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We love you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. We exalt you, Lord.
number 61.
brethren, that was our final collective song for this morning. So if you'll take your seats at this time, we'll collect tithes and offerings. Praise the Lord, everybody. Welcome, all of you who are watching today. Hope you're having a wonderful Sabbath today, entering in the blessing of the Lord. Any of you here who have prayer requests you'd like us to burn with our incense, uh, write it down and put it in this bowl or have um, hold it up and we'll come and get it. We do have special music today. Aubrey is going to sing, There Is a Fountain. And Sarah is going to sing, Sing to Jesus. Um, I guess you saw the post uh, about Kelsey. Praise God. She's probably watching. Hello. Greetings from the Crusade Church. Used to be your home church. Maybe still is. Um, so that was wonderful that... Uh, She's been delivered, praise God. Um, as you notice, that Matthew isn't here today. He's croupy, started getting sick last night. So some of these things are going around. Michael, make sure these are burned today. Uh, any other prayer requests or any updates? No? Anyone need anointing today? No marvelous. Everybody's healthy that's here. That's good. That's a, that's a plus. Amen. Um, I don't think there's anything else right offhand. So I guess at this time we'll have Jody come up, pray with these prayer requests, and then we'll have special music. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we're so thankful to you Thankful that you love us, Lord, and thankful that we have this day to come before you 
Lord, and just raise these prayer requests to you. Father, we're thankful for Jesus' sacrifice that allows us to come straight into your throne room and, and ask that you'll do your will in these. We know because you love us that you'll do the best thing possible, Father, and we always look forward to the outcome. We thank you and we love you in Jesus' name. Amen.
And while we do that, we do have a testimony. Statius has a testimony, so we'll have her come up and give the testimony before the sermon. Um, I have a couple testimonies. One's kind of small, but I just wanted to thank the Lord. Um, I guess it was two weeks ago on Sunday. We were going to Fayetteville area for Aubrey's ACT test, and the weather was supposed to be bad. And so we, I knew it was supposed to rain and freeze that night, so we left Saturday night to try to beat the weather. But little did I know that we didn't beat the weather. Um, It started earlier than I anticipated, and I didn't realize that we were driving on icy roads even until um, we started coming into seeing all the, the accidents uh, along the way. So I just um, wanted to praise the Lord and thank him for that, that he, he was protecting us even when I didn't even know we needed protection <laughs> um, and kept us safe that night. It ended up to be a, a blessed night together, Aubrey and I. So, um, But my main testimony uh, is actually not my testimony. It's one that I heard at work, and I, I told this young lady I was going to share it with my church so that God would get the glory for it. Um, I know that it really uh, affected me when she told me. Um, so uh, so this this young lady just recently got married, um, so she doesn't have any children of her own, but her sister has two little boys, and um, they're four, and then I think one is about six months old. Um, and she's really close to these little boys. Uh, they're like her kids. She talks about them all the time. Um, but she lives about, I don't know, it's several hours away, maybe three hours away from them. Um, but she received a call one day uh, from the sheriff's office asking if she had her four-year-old nephew. And she thought it was a joke at first, but it, you know, he clearly made it, he made it clear very, very quickly in the conversation that it was very serious, the little boy was missing. Um, and I guess what had happened was the family, it's the father and mother and the two children, and they had fallen asleep for an afternoon nap or something. And when they woke up at, I guess it was about 9 o'clock in the evening, um, the little boy was gone and the back door was open. Um, so, I mean, they, of course, <laughs> freaked out. Um, anyway, she... She received a call from her sister shortly after, and of course her sister couldn't even talk, and she just kept screaming, my baby, my baby, and at the top of her lungs, and I'm sorry, this story is secondhand. You almost had to, you had to hear it firsthand, obviously, but like I said, I just want God to give, get the glory for it, but um, so anyway, they, of course, called the police, and she said that there was, there was five policemen and five paramedics that they sent, I guess, because I assume because they don't know what they're going to find in a situation like that. And the dad had, the father had taken off through backyards yelling and jumping fences and looking for this little boy. And I guess they, you know, the mother was just hysterical in the living room and the, the police and the paramedics searched. She said they searched the entire house. They opened every cabinet. They flipped over every piece of furniture because, you know, little children like to hide. They think it's funny. And I guess they've run into that before. And and some time passed, and they they never found him. He was gone. Um, And I think the mother at one point, you know, said, what what do we do now, or something. And they, you know, of course, they just said to pray. And that's all, just pray, because it didn't look good. They had looked, I think, for a while, um, all of them, and he was just nowhere. And so anyway, the church family came over there and involved in a church. Of course, she said, you know, of course she was praying. She said as soon as she heard the news, you know, she couldn't even talk. And she turned to her husband and said, you're going to have to pray. I can't even talk. And they, she said they were driving there, and he was praying nonstop the entire way that he, the Lord would have that little boy in his hands. And, of course, the Lord did. And um, anyway, the church family got there, and they prayed and she said one lady uh, spoke up, and, um, and she said that the Lord told her that that little boy was asleep in the house. And um, the mom just, she kind of was, 
I don't know, but she's, I think she kind of was angry because they had looked everywhere, and she said, he's not here. And she walked over to the couch where the little boy had been laying asleep, and she said, he was right here. And as she put her hand down, he was there. She put her hand on his head, and uh, she grabbed him up, and um, he woke up at that point, you know, and was crying because everyone was around him, and, you know, I just thought, I immediately, my immediate reaction is, you know, it was, how, you know, it's a miracle, because the, how, he, I don't know, they had flipped over everything, the, um, he, the mom was screaming, why would he not wake up, so I, I don't know, I, you know, and, and then I said, you know, I said, did, did the police and the paramedics, what did they do, and she, you know, you just can't help but give glory to God, it's a, it was a miracle, like, it, they said they, they don't know how it happened, they're glad that it ended up that way, but they, you know, it was, it was the prayers, it was a miracle, and so, um, God got the glory, and God, you know, it's just a reminder. It was really precious to me to think, as we've been hearing, you know, that he, he's a loving father, and he, he loved that little boy. He loves that little boy more than they could ever imagine loving that little boy, and he had him. I don't know where. I don't know how. I don't, you know, just so he could get the glory, I guess, but he had him the whole time, and, uh, and so it, it blessed me, and I, it, like I said, it blesses me that God get, got the glory for that. So I wanted to continue that. Prayer now, after that. But I guess we could talk a little bit more about God's love. Amen. You know, those of us who, <clears throat> all of us have experienced love, those of us who have children, especially small children who depend upon us and whom uh, we have and feel a strong sense of responsibility to protect. Um, we feel a very strong bond, a love, a sacrificial love that we would lay down our life for our children. And, um, but even so, as Stacia was saying in her testimony, um, God loves with a love much greater, far greater. And uh, you know the story about uh, when I had my first vision years ago, and uh, I, in that vision, I entered what I th thought was the body of Jesus, which I guess was in a sense, it was Jesus in me and him on the cross. And when I entered in, to that body that was being crucified, I experienced something that was very foreign to me, a love that I'd never, ever felt, even though, you know, at the time, I had been, you know, the, married to the love of my life and Treon, and, and uh, you know, we had five children together, and we, we loved them dearly. But this was a far uh, deeper and it wasn't even recognizable. It's honestly, it's kind of like what we explored last week in that if we don't love, if, if our love for God does not look like, uh, or our love for our family or this world or even ourselves doesn't look like hate in comparison to our love uh, to, toward God, uh, then we're not worthy of Jesus. And no, we can't do that on our own. We, we understand that there's not any possible way that in the natural man, we're going to have that kind of love. The, the only thing that will give us that kind of love is the love that is placed in us when by the Holy Spirit, Jesus comes and he's living his life in us. And then we have that kind of love, the kind of love that I experienced in that first vision that I had and I entered into the body on the cross, which was me and Jesus together because we're one body. I'm a member of his body and I experienced, I didn't expect to experience that. I experienced to expect, I, I expected to experience, of course, pain. Um, and understand that while I was on the cross, the mockers were there. The people who had crucified me were there. The people that were taking pleasure in that crucifixion and my pain were there. Yet 
I felt a love for them that was beyond any kind of love. Now think about that. I felt a love for those who hated me, a love for those who were crucifying me, and those who were watching me with pleasure. I felt a love for them far superior than actually it was not recognizable to the love that I had uh, had for my wife or my family, my mother or anybody else. And I might add even my own life. So with Christ, we can have a love for, by which that we, you know, our life means nothing. Our life on this earth means nothing by comparison. I want to talk today about salvation. That's what I want to talk about. But, you know, before we get into uh, salvation, we need to understand that our, our God, our Father, loves His sons. And we're male and female in this life. But in Christ Jesus, when we, all of you are sons of God, all of you are. Whether male or female here, it doesn't matter. In God's sight, you're sons of God. All of those who have received the Holy Spirit and are being led by the Holy Spirit, these are the sons of God. So we are sons of God. And so we're equal heirs of God's kingdom and the promises that are contained in the covenant that he ratified with the blood of Jesus. And you know, God uh, lost. He lost fellowship with the first humans long ago in the garden. Oftentimes we think of it in terms of, and, and we've preached it, we've commented, this is what you normally hear. Man stepped away from God and he was cut off from God. Man lost his relationship or his fellowship with God. And it isn't that that's not true, but we really should look at it from God's perspective. Think about it. God created every single person for a special, uh, to fulfill a special role. You know, all of us uh, are, we have no rival for what God has created us to be. We often talk about being, you know, a member of the body, an individual member, and every member is different and every member is necessary. And that's true in the body of Christ, but we were created also by the Father for a specific purpose that, that only we can fill to Him. But that's a fact. We, we understand that even by the fact that He tells us to pray, that we have one-on-one -on -one, uh, conversation that he invites us to come one-on-one -on -one with him in prayer. He hears us, we speak to him, and if we listen, we will hear him back. You see, that's intimate. And I don't know what each one of us, uh, what, what specific desire that we will bring to God, to bring him pleasure and fulfillment. I don't know what that is. I don't know what it is, but I know that, that God created me as a son. And as a son, to have a special one-on-one -on -one purpose and fulfillment with him and him alone. That's why he, he has given me a new name, which no one knows except he and me. And he's given all of you it will give each one a new name that only you, it will be special between you. This is special what we do here. When God tells us to come together with a holy convocation and we come here and we worship God together and that pleases the Lord. The Lord says how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell in unity. He talked about how sweet that is, how wonderful it is, how it pleases him when brethren dwell together in unity and in harmony. He loves that. He loves it when we love each other, we, we give and we serve and we sacrifice for each other. And we suffer long for each other. He loves that. 
But there's also that one-on-one special time that all of us will have with our Father periodically through all eternity. That creating something, doing something, fulfilling something, becoming something, I don't know. That only he and each one of us can do. No one else can do. In the body of Christ, a foot cannot be a hand and a hand cannot be a foot. Maybe it can function as one, but not as well, because it's not created for that. An eye cannot hear, an ear cannot see. And for whatever purpose that God himself created us, he created us for his glory, for his pleasure. Each one of us. He planned your birth. He created you to be a special object of his affection in order to be something to him and to do something with him, to create something together with him that no one else can do. And that's precious. And I don't even want to think about talking about salvation and why someone would need to be saved without first saying that your birth was planned, you're special, you are unlike anyone else, you have no rivals. No rivals for what God has made you to be. And first of all, he made us to be an object of his affection and to fulfill something that he wanted to create that only you and he and anyone else listening could create, could become, could do. It's like in that film that some of us have seen, The Heart of Man, where the old, the father, which represents God the Father, and, and then the son, which doesn't represent Jesus, it represents one of us. The father crafts, hand makes him a violin with his name on it. And he gives it to him, and together they sit and they make beautiful, create beautiful music that could not have been created without both of them. Listening to a violin is beautiful. A violin is a beautiful instrument, has a beautiful resonating sound. It can do so many things, but two violins can create harmony. You know, a single violin doesn't create harmony. A single violin is playing a note. But it's like you and the Father create harmony. It's like that. It's like listening to a beautiful voice and then hearing someone come in behind it with harmony. That's what you and God alone can do. And no one else can be your harmony. You alone can be your harmony. And that's a wonderful thing. So it wasn't so man, it wasn't so much that man, you know, lost his fellowship with God when he sinned in the garden. But it was more so that God lost his fellowship with man. God did not walk away, man walked away. It was man who sinned. And fellowship was broken. And we think about what fellowship is. Fellowship is unity. It is living in unity, thinking in unity, walking in unity, being like-minded and in agreement. Having shared interest. That's what fellowship is. That's why I don't like it when we hear people say that God wants a relationship. God already has a relationship. A relationship can be good or bad. A relationship can be adversarial. We have a relationship with North Korea. (laughs) It's adversarial. You know, we have a strained relationship with China over trade. We We have a relationship, but it's strained. You know, you may have relationships that are strained, You know why it's strained? Because you're not walking in harmony. Because you're not in fellowship. 
The Bible clearly doesn't say relationship. First John says fellowship. That when we walk in the truth, we have fellowship. It's fellowship. Relationship basically implies that you don't have to be on the same page. But in order for you to be what God created you to be, and for you and he to create a perfect, harmonious, whatever it is, creation, there has to be fellowship. Someone can't be out of tune. Amen? What does it sound like if someone is a step late or a step early? Beautiful violin is playing, and then the harmony is to come in. It comes in too early, comes in too late, comes in out of key, comes in flat or sharp. There's no harmony there. There's no fellowship of notes there. You see, there's no unity of notes. There's disharmony. And so God created us for a very special purpose. And people need to understand that, those of you who are watching. You know, this is why you need saved. This is why God wants to save you. Because he created you for a very special purpose. He created you, first of all, for himself. All things are created by God and for God and for his pleasure. He created you to be his pleasure, to be an object of affection. And when you don't come to him and when you walk contrary to his way and you keep him at an arm's distance and you don't come in with harmony and you don't, you don't play the same song that he's playing, there's no fellowship there. And it's broken. And it was broken by sin. And when you look at the world and you engage in the things of the world, if you keep God at an arm's distance, then that's why. You might, it took a high price. It took a very high price in order to restore you to the Father. How do we come to the Father? Through the torn flesh of Jesus. As Blake read in his sermonette, Hebrews chapter 10. It took the torn flesh of the Son of God. Now the Son of God, Jesus, was with the Father from the very beginning. He had no beginning of days nor end of days. He was equal with the Father from all eternity. But in order to save man to redeem him, to make a way back to the Father. This is what the Father saw. He saw a great gulf. There was no way for his son to come back. Even if his son wanted to come back, and he was calling from afar, come, but a great distance. And you know all it takes, all it takes for a sinner or a prodigal son, all it takes is for that person to say, help me. Help me. Make a way for me. And God did. He sent his own son to be tortured, to be beaten beyond recognition, to have his flesh torn from his body through that terrible scourging and to be nailed to a tree because the law of Moses said whoever is, whoever is hung on a tree is cursed forever. They will never live again. But Jesus was nailed cursed and he received our curse for us and he rose on the third day, hallelujah. But that's why. That's why you need saved. You need saved because you have sinned. You have fallen short of the glory of God. We've all done evil. We may not think of it as evil, but God sees it as evil. So God has done his part. He, he has given the life of his only son, and Jesus laid down that life in order that we might make a way back to the Father. And there's a veil there. There was always a veil there. 
in the Holy of Holies. And there's still a veil there between anyone and the Father. But that veil today is the torn flesh of Jesus. And understand it had to be torn. You couldn't go through it. You couldn't pass through it. There would be no way through it unless it was torn. So when we come to the Father, understand the heavy price of what it took for him to make, the way. Think about what Jesus said. He said, I am the way. And no one comes to the Father except by me. What does that mean? That means he knew that his flesh had to be torn. He had to suffer death to pay for the penalty of our sins. He had to be scourged to where his flesh hung like ribbons in order that he would become the door. When you think of Jesus as the door or the gate, don't think of that as a beautiful, elaborate, golden door or an antique, beautiful, wooden door. No, no. It was the torn flesh. It was a veil. It was a door that was a veil that you would pass through. And that's the price our Father paid. Your Father and mine. He's not going to throw you away. He loves you with a love greater than what we can ever, ever imagine. He loves every son. He loves every son who never left, who stayed faithful. And he loves every son who became a prodigal son, who left. And he still stands, and he's waiting for a single word, help. He's waiting to hear, help me. And that's all it takes. And he'll move heaven and earth to bring that child home. Now, the Father's love is perfect, it's forgiving, it's compassionate, it's pure, and it's sacrificial. Let's go over to Zephaniah chapter 3. Zephaniah chapter 3, right before Haggai, right after Habakkuk, and the minor prophets. Here in Zephaniah chapter 3, notice verse 17. The Lord your God is in your midst, a victorious warrior. Now literally that means a warrior who saves. If you look in your, if you have a good margin and you look in that, that's the literal meaning of that. The Lord your God is in your midst, a victorious warrior who saves. God knows that everyone needs salvation. He will exult over you with joy. He will be quiet or renew you, is what that means, in his love. And he will rejoice over you with shouts of joy. He will dance over us and rejoice. He will not contain himself, for he is a mighty warrior. When need be, when you call upon him, help me, he will be a victorious warrior who saves. He will be there and he will deliver you from the grips of the devil. You may think that you can't, you may think that you're so entangled in the world that there's no way out, that you've done so much that that you can never be forgiven. That's all just a lie from the enemy. That's all it is. That's it. The apostle Paul considered himself a murderer, attacking the church, Dragging people off. 
to imprison them, some to be put to death, like Stephen, who was in, he was in hearty agreement with. He became perhaps the greatest apostle of all after the Lord called him. He who has sinned much loves much. That's what Jesus said. And I have, I have witnessed that with people. I have to say my life has been pretty sheltered. But some of the greatest sinners become the greatest saints. And some of those who have walked away to become sinners, but then later to become prodigal sons, have become great in the sight of the Lord and used mightily because they have seen the difference. Amen. Let's go over to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, beginning of verse 12. Paul said, So then, brethren, we are under obligation not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. And if you do a, just a quick study on that word adoption, it, it doesn't actually, what it actually says is set as sons. You're appointed as sons. You're set as sons. The spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are the children of God, and if children were heirs also, heirs of God, think of the riches of heaven, and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed in us, for the anxious longing of the creation, notice, waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. Why do you suppose that is? Because we're a part of the solution, not the problem. And we play, if you read on, we're not going to read on this part because it's not what we're talking about. But the whole creation is going to be set free by the sons of God, at the revelation of the sons of God. Verse 31, what shall we say to these things? We say if God is for us, then who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Believe that. Remember that verse. He didn't spare his own son in order to save us. So if he's willing to give his own son in the manner in which he had to suffer and die, how is it that we would think that he would, would withhold anything from us? God will not withhold anything from you that will bring about good for you and in your life. If God denies you anything it will only be something that later, if you choose to do what he has denied, and you will, you will regret it. You will realize then the sorrow and the suffering. And it's not what you think it is. God has good plans for us. He does not withhold us anything that is good. Think about it. It's pictured in the Garden of Eden. In the Garden of Eden was perhaps thousands of beautiful trees with beautiful, delicious fruit for the nourishment of the first humans. And then there was a tree of life by which if they ate of it, they would live forever. 
And then there was one tree that was in order to test them. A forbidden tree that looked good. It looked good, but it wasn't good. Did the fruit taste good? It did taste good. How do we know? Because Eve said, hey, this is good. Gave it to her husband. It looked good, desirable to the eyes. She thought it was good. Her eyes looked good. You know, at some point when she began to look, her spiritual eyes were closed and her fleshly eyes were open. Her desire for to please the Lord and to be honorable and obedient to him somehow was replaced with a desire to satisfy the flesh and to draw into question the veracity of God's word. And as a result of that, she died. Now listen, she didn't die that day. She lived a long time, hundreds of years. Adam lived over 900 years. He didn't die that day. But the day that he ate of that fruit, he brought death into our family. And he created a, a gulf between God, a loving God, a loving creator, and man. And we all sin. We all, we've all followed the first Adam. And we've all sinned. There is nothing that God wants to deny you that will bring about joy and peace and happiness and prosper you. And understand that that was the lie. God is withholding something from you. Did not get wider. Did God not say all that you could eat of any of the trees in the garden? Yes, but all of them but this one. And we don't know what all the conversation was. A servant probably said, well, why did God put it here? And if it's not good, why did God make it look good? Won't you have a taste? And she did, and it tasted good. And she told Adam, look, it looks good, tastes good, must be good. But Kool-Aid with a little cyanide in it tastes good too. And the pleasure is momentary. Man, that tastes good. I like that Kool-Aid. Especially the strawberry flavored Kool-Aid. Kind of like I grew up with. But with the cyanide in it, you're going to die. And that's, we don't want to take death into, a, into us. God has placed in our heart eternity. The Bible says that God has placed eternity in every man's heart. We are mortal. We're not eternal beings. We're not an eternal soul living in a, you know, a fleshly body. Ezekiel chapter uh, 18 says, a soul that sins shall die. It says it twice. Verse 2 and verse 20. The soul, that, the soul that sins shall die. God's gift is eternal life in Christ Jesus. And we don't have life unless we have him. But let's read this again, verse 32. First of all, remember God is for us. He's not against us. You know, listen, y'all. Uh, many of us never really had uh, you know, a strong, godly father figure. I didn't. Many of you didn't. Some of you may have. But many of you didn't. You know, my father left at a very early age, and then I had a, a stepfather who was there and provided for me. But I knew that he was there for my mother, not for me. Even though he cared for me, he took me in and he adopted me, you see. But it's not the same thing. So sometimes our um, view of our Heavenly Father is tainted by the experience we have of our Father or the lack of a Father or uh, what we see fathers do in the news. Just yesterday, um, a father decapitated his two-year-old son 
because he was trying to take a nap and the son wouldn't be quiet. And he decapitated. He cut his head off. Then after he realized what he did, he tried to kill himself by slashing his wrists. Very few fathers, I, I mean, I was, I was blessed by being called at a very early age when my first child of five was a baby. And you know, there was something, we did things together as a family, but there was always something special between each child and me that only we did or we had an interest in with each one. And um, as imperfect as that is in this life, that kind of pictures a little bit about how God does with his family. Not only are we collective collectively his family doing things collectively and but there's always that intimate one on one you and I have a special interest only together that no two other others have and that's very special verse 32 he who did not spare his own son hear that but delivered him over for us all How will he not also with him freely give us all things? Freely give us all things. Listen, you're children of the king. You're children of the king of all. God not only, our father not only owns everything, he has created everything and he can create anything any time. It's a sad thing to realize that you're an heir of infinite wealth of every kind, not just wealth of treasure, which we have in heaven, but pleasures forevermore, the fullness of joy to to just throw that away by reaching down and picking up a grimy penny out of the mud. And that's what it is. But the devil will cause you to think that way. The devil will try to cause you to see the forbidden fruit as something that is desirable. The first thing that Eve should have realized is don't even talk and listen to the serpent. Don't even go near that tree. Don't look at that tree to see if the fruit looks desirable. Because when you look, it will look desirable. But it will kill you. It's not good, and you don't want to die. You don't want to die. You don't want to suffer the second death. So who will bring a charge against God's elect? Verse 33, God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Jesus Christ is he who died. Yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Verse 35, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Well, tribulation, now see, listen to me. Nothing is going to separate you from the love of Christ or the love of your Father. But there are things that can separate your love for Him. You can lose your first love, like those in Ephesus. And Jesus said, I know how you've done many things and how you've been faithful in many ways and you've tested those who say they are apostles and you have found them that they are liars. And there's many things that you do good, but I have this one thing against you. You have left your first love. Now I'm counseling you that 
that you repent and do the things. Love is doing things. Do the things you did at first or I'm coming and I'm going to take my lampstand. Now that's where the oil is. That's the Holy Spirit. They'd no longer be the church. They'd be, the Holy Spirit would be removed from them. If you pursue the flesh, God will take the Holy Spirit. He may be a t- period of time. He may wait. He may try to convict you for a period of time using the Spirit. But if you continue to push him away, he will take the Holy Spirit back just like he did King Saul. And David knew that. David saw that. So when David sinned with Bathsheba and Uriah, uh, you know, or with uh, yeah, Uriah, what he said was, in his prayer, we find in Psalm 51, when he said, Father, take not your Holy Spirit from me. He knew it could happen. Renew a right spirit in me. Create in me a clean heart. And take not your Holy Spirit from me. He had seen what had happened when the Holy Spirit was taken from Saul and then an evil spirit was sent to torment him and David would play music to try to soothe Saul so the spirit would not attack him. But sometimes the spirit, that evil spirit would come upon Saul and Saul would try to kill David. David saw all that. He knew how dangerous it was to flirt with losing God's Holy Spirit. Most everyone in here has made a commitment. You have made a vow to God. And God says, I will hold you to your vows. You don't come, you know, anybody comes and say, I want to be baptized. I say very simply, you have to be willing to lay down your life if it comes to that. You have to be a sheep led to the slaughter if it comes to that. You have to be willing to be alone if everybody that you know, your family, your friends, Church members, whoever, turn and leave. You have to be there and stand alone with God. Now, if you're willing to do that, then I'll baptize you. And I'll baptize no one that didn't say yes to that. And God heard every word and it's recorded in heaven. So it's not a light thing when someone turns and goes wallowing like a sow in the mud, you know, But I pray even then that those prodigal sons would come to their senses and come back. Reach the end of their rope and come back. Find out that the fruit that they have taken is really poisonous. So verse 30, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. Now, we think about that, and we can say, okay, regardless of what we go through, Christ is there. He's with us. You know, in the film, The Heart of Man, there's a minister that had a, uh, a problem with pornography, And it's interesting because he preached, I think, at a college, a Christian college, exhorting the uh, students there to live pure lives and to not get involved in impure and immoral things. And then immediately, the devil attacked him with strong temptations And he went on a pornography binge, he said, and he felt so terrible. And he didn't even, he he couldn't even go home to his wife, he said. The next morning, he felt the call to prayer. And he thought, this isn't going to be good. The father is really mad at me. I'm a hypocrite. But that's not what he found. He found a forgiving father who just wanted him convicted, wanted him to see how weak he was, how much he needed Jesus, and that through Christ he had the power to overcome. And then he saw, maybe it was in a dream, maybe it was in a vision, I don't remember, but he saw himself in a prison. And he was 
in one of those orange jumpsuits and he's in the mess hall and he's a cafeteria and he's carrying his plate. No one would sit with him. No one wanted to sit with him or allow him to sit with them. And he went and he sat alone. And then through the door comes Jesus in the same orange jumpsuit in the prison and walks over and sits across from him at the same table. And he was shocked that Jesus would be there, even there in his sin and in his brokenness. And he said, you would eat with me here? And Jesus said, son, I'll eat with you anywhere. And by the way, the door is open. You can leave anytime. And that man said he's never forgotten that. And that changed his life. And the love of God does that. I mean, you can't just preach the love of God without preaching the wrath of God. But when you understand that deep love of God, you understand why there is a wrath of God. You understand why there is a hell which wasn't made for men, made for Satan and his angels. God never made hell for men. He says so. Hell was not made for man, for, for Satan and his demons. But anyone that will follow them, they're following them where they're going. So he said, what will separate us? Will any of these things separate us? And it says, verse 36, it is written, for your sake we're being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Now think about that. I mean, we, have to, we are sheep. We think of ourselves as sheep and we're following our shepherd and he loves us and he protects us. And, but understand that some of the Lord's sheep has been slaughtered. The ravenous wolves have come in, not sparing the flock, as we see in Acts chapter 20. These are realities. Persecutions, hardships, they're realities. But even in this, and we've seen this with ISIS sweeping across the Middle East, uh, making slaves of Christians, making sex slaves out of young women and children, uh, murdering, torturing, crucifying, beheading those who were, would not renounce Christ. But in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loves us. Even if these things happen, even if we give up our life, even if we're martyred, I mean, think all the apostles were martyred except John, and he was imprisoned. But God loved them as a father. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now let's go over to Ephesians chapter 2 quickly. Ephesians chapter 2, notice verse 1. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working where? In the sons of disobedience. Among them we all too formerly lived in the lust of our flesh. We indulged the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and we were by our very nature children of wrath, wrath, even as everybody else. But God, being rich in mercy, and because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, he made us alive together 
with Christ. By grace, you've been saved. And we find in the book of Hebrews that, that even while we were yet sinners, he saved us, loved us, and saved us. And he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Now let's go to the notes that, that you have there. The three great questions. Now last Sabbath we explored the sobering Bible truth that only a few will be saved. Now this solemn question belongs to a group of three questions found in the New Testament which have to do with salvation. Why do I need saved? Who can be saved? And what must I do to be saved and remain saved? Unfortunately, the very idea of salvation seems strange in the world which we live. You know, if you talk to people, it does seem strange. They don't understand why they need salvation. The average person would wonder why he even needed salvation and, or what he would be saved from. The idea of sin seems to be a relic of past ages. Most people consider themselves as being a good person. You know, the Bible says that when asked, every man will declare his own goodness. And then they will quickly recite a list of reasons why they are good. We've all heard it. Perhaps we've all done it. But the Bible defines sin as a transgression of God's law. God's law, in its broadest sense, is His instruction. And there is a penalty for committing sin. The penalty is eternal death in the lake of fire. And all who have committed sin are in need of salvation from that penalty. Life itself is a gift from God, and He can take it back whenever He wants. We have only temporary life. But through Jesus Christ, God is offering us eternal life through this great salvation. You know, Peter asked, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? It's just simply neglecting that salvation. It's like neglecting, you know, you're, you're on a rooftop and the floodwaters are rising and you know, neglect, neglect a rescue boat come by or a helicopter that's rescuing people. You just neglect it. You say, I'm, I'm cool. I'm fine right where I am. Well, you're not. Amen? The water will overtake you. If you were to ask most people how they would stand up to God's standard, as defined by the Ten Commandments, most will initially appear confident. But have you ever lied? Have you ever taken something that didn't belong to you? Have you ever looked upon a person with sexual lust in your heart? Have you always honored and obeyed your parents? Have you ever taken God's name in vain? Have you ever coveted something that belonged to someone else? Now think about that. Coveting, the 10th commandment. Coveting is not taking something that is not yours. It's merely desiring it. There's no action. And it seems as though no one is harmed. Yet God sees it as he does sexual lust, the sin of the heart. You know, a lot of people say, well, listen, if it's okay, I'm not, I'm not hurting anybody. So if I'm not hurting anybody with the things that I do and my lifestyle, then it's not wrong. Well, that's just, no. You see, you're corrupting what God created you. He is your creator. You belong to him. He purchased you with his own blood. And when you corrupt what he has made to be holy with sins of the heart, you violated your very reason for being. If we're honest, we realize that none of us can survive this quiz, this quiz unscathed. We know we've broken these commandments. We stand convicted that we have been shown to be liars, blasphemers, thieves, adulterers at heart. But still we have a tendency to defend ourselves by pointing the finger at everyone else, saying, everybody else has done these things, I'm no different. This may be true, but it won't help you on judgment day. 
Suppose you get a ticket for speeding and before the judge you say other people were speeding too. My great uncle got a ticket for speeding. He was in his 80s. And uh, the uh, state trooper came up to his window and he said, now, uh, do you know why I, I uh, pulled you over? He said, well, yeah, I, I guess you pulled me over because you couldn't catch those who were passing me. That's his way of saying, I wasn't the only one speeding. You know, why didn't you get people that were doing worse than me? But it comes down to eventually everybody gets it. Amen? You might escape a state trooper, but you're not escaping God. It's all recorded. So you might say to the judge, other people were speeding too. Would the judge pardon you? Though you stand guilty? The judge would say, I, deal, I will deal with those other violators as they appear before me, but today is your day in court. Most people seem to allot little time for God or for the things of God. It is only the few who love him and who are prepared to declare their love for him and to live for him in a way that pleases him. Though salvation is a free gift from God, there is a cost to being a true disciple of Christ. And sometimes we think about the cost. What is cost? What, what am I going to have to give up? Look what I got to give up. Think about what the Father gave up. He gave up His Son. Think about what Jesus gave up, equality with God. He came here as a man to taste torture and death and betrayal. Do you think you're going to have to give up any? Do you think God doesn't give up? God's given up. God gave up because of his love for you. Are you not willing to give up anything for your love for him? You're not giving up anything that will bring about good. If people leave you, it's because they cannot fellowship with you. That's simply the way it is. There is no way of fellowship. You know why? Because the veil, they're not coming through the veil. You're not going out the veil and leaving the Father, are you? Are you going out the veil to leave the Father to go to the world and people in the world? No. You're staying with the Father and you're saying, you come. You come through the veil. Well, many people don't want to come through the veil. They're very comfortable in the world. They don't want to come to the Father at this time. You cannot have fellowship. It's impossible. The only way you have, you can't have fellowship. The only way you can have a relationship is to go out from God through the torn flesh of Jesus that you just came through to get to God, which he didn't provide that. You know, but it's a two-way, think about it. The veil goes two ways. You can leave God, but he will not leave you. And he will not follow you out. He will call you to come back in. So there's a cost, but not just a cost for us of being a disciple. God the Father and Jesus paid the ultimate cost, the ultimate price. Jesus even now stands at the altar with his own blood to intercede for us. We'd be better off thinking more and appreciating more of what the Father and the Son gave up than what we may have to give up. The answer to the question, who can be saved, is everyone. Jesus gave his life to save every soul who will repent of their sins and faithfully follow him. Peter wrote, the Lord is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. And Paul wrote, God, our Savior, desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Though the Bible makes it clear that God has suffered, offered salvation to all, few will actually do what is necessary to receive that salvation. There will be many who will be shocked to learn that they are denied interest into the kingdom of heaven. Many of these people will have lived their lives believing that they were saved Christians, but they had been Christian in name only and had never truly submitted to God's will, and they lived lawless lives. 
Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven, he will enter. And many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not assign your name? And in your name we cast out demons, and in your name we perform many miracles. Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Now, you know what Peter said. He said, if it, was, if it is with extreme difficulty that the righteous are saved, then what will become of those who are not? Those who are unrighteous and unjust and neglect so great a salvation. Now let's go over to Romans chapter 5. Why do I need saved? Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all sinned. Verse 18. So then, through one transgression, as, as, so then, as through one transgression, there resulted condemnation to all men. Even so, through one act of righteousness, there resulted justification of life to all men. That's through Jesus. For as through the one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, even through the obedience of the one, the many will be made righteous. Now back over in chapter 3, notice verse 10. Quoting the Old Testament, quoting God, Paul says, There is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. You will not, no one will declare their righteousness before their heavenly Father and be just. There will be people like we just read in, in Matthew 7 that will tell God all the things they did for him. But they will have been deceived and blinded. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside together. They have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Their throat is an open grave and their tongues, with their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of ass is under their lips whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths. And the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Then verse 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now in chapter 6, and that's the problem. But God has placed eternity in our hearts. We don't want to die. And God doesn't want us to suffer the second death either. That's why he gave his son. Here in uh, uh, Romans uh, 6, we'll begin in verse uh, 23, or 20. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. Therefore, what benefit were you then deriving from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the outcome of those things is death. But now having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you derive your benefit. And it results in sanctification. And the outcome of this sanctification is eternal life. Now, it's not just eternal life. It's eternal life with the fullness of joy. It's eternal life with the Father that none of us has ever had, that is a true Father. It is pleasures forevermore and fulfillment. No pain, no sorrow, no suffering, no tears, except maybe there be tears of joy. For the wages of sin is death. Now notice, the outcome is eternal life of these things, of our sanctification. The outcome is eternal life. But the wages of sin is death. But God's free gift is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And that's what he's offering. We need saved because we are sinners. We need saved because we are selfish. We have walked away from God or we never sought God in the first place. We were maybe 
born, raised, never thinking about our Father. But we have a Heavenly Father. Our Creator is a Father. And sometimes it's important for us to understand uh, the terms, that family term, because sometimes God seems so different. I mean, how many gods of mythology were faithful fathers? You see, the God of war, the God of fortune, the, the, the God of fertility, I mean, the God of the sun, you know, the moon, <clears throat> the trees, <clears throat> different constellations. But the true God is not only the creator, he is our father. And he planned your birth. And he doesn't want to lose you. He may not have you. But all you have to say is, help me. Help me, Father. I don't know how I can deal with with these desires that you don't want me to have. But help me, and he will. And he'll make you a new creation in Christ Jesus. Let's go to John chapter 3. So who can be saved? John chapter 3. You know, the context of what we normally read as the gospel message in John chapter 3 is where Nicodemus, a Jewish teacher, who would come to Jesus by night so he wouldn't be seen by the other Jewish teachers uh, to talk to Jesus and learn of him. He was wondering who he was. He was wanting to know if he was the promised Messiah that the Jews were looking to. Are you the one that's going to usher in the kingdom, restore the kingdom and sovereignty back to the nation Israel? Because that's what they believed the Messiah would do. He would be a conquering warrior hero, a king. So Nicodemus came to Jesus by night. And he wanted to know who he was. He said, now we know you're a teacher sent from God. We know that already. But before he could even ask the question, we really want to know, are you a prophet? Are you the Messiah, the promised one, the anointed one? And Jesus just said, Nicodemus, unless you be born again, you cannot see the kingdom of heaven. You're asking me if I am the Messiah that's going to restore the kingdom to Israel. And I'm telling you that unless you're born again, you cannot see it. You think it's enough to be born of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and you're an heir of the promises. But I'm telling you the promises of Abraham are not for a land flowing of milk and honey, but it's for a heavenly country. And as we see in Hebrews chapter 11, Abraham was looking for a city whose builder and architect is God. He was looking for a heavenly country, it says. He wasn't excited about a land with fig trees and honey and milk. That's good. I like all of those things. I like the beauty of this world, but it is a fallen world. It cannot compare to the heavenly country and the new heavens and the new earth which God is going to bring about. And there's no city that can compare to the new Jerusalem, the holy city which we have been given citizenship of. That's the context. That's the context. Uh, that's who's hearing what Jesus says when Jesus goes on. And Nicodemus couldn't understand. He said, well, how can a man be born again? And he said, well, you have to be born of the Spirit. It's like the wind. You hear it come, you hear it go. You don't know where it came from or where it's going. 
So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. And Nicodemus just couldn't understand these things. And Jesus said, you're a teacher and you don't understand these things? So he went on to say, verse 12, I've told you of earthly things, Nicodemus, and you do not believe. How will you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? He's talking to Nicodemus. Don't you understand? No one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, me, the son of man. Elijah did not go to paradise. He went to heaven. Enoch went to heaven, but he didn't go to paradise. He didn't see death, but he died because he's named as one of those who died in Hebrews chapter 11. So was Elijah. So they're awaiting the resurrection like everyone else. No one has ascended to into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. That's what Jesus tell him. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. When Moses lifted up that standard with the serpent on it in the wilderness, then everyone who was bitten by those fiery serpents would be healed. So he's saying just if you, you have to receive healing, you have to receive salvation from me. And as Moses lifted up the serpent, even though the Son of Man must be lifted up, because we've all been bit by that fiery serpent, the devil, amen? So that whoever believes will in him have eternal life. You see, we all have received the poison of the devil. They received the poison of those fiery serpents. They didn't die immediately, but if they didn't look upon the standard which was raised for their healing, which our medical profession uses to this very day, uh, they would not be cured. They would die. In the same way with us. We've been poisoned, and we need an antidote. The antidote is Jesus Christ. For God so loved, that's the context of this. And then he says, for God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Now this is Nicodemus is saying, why is he talking about the world? We're talking about Israel. We're talking about restoring Israel. He's talking about the whole world. That's because that's who can be saved. That's who he gave his life for. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send the son into the world to judge the world, that the world might be saved through him. Now understand the context. Nicodemus is looking for a Messiah. What will the Messiah do when he does come as a ruling king? He will judge. He will sit and judge between the nations. He will separate the sheep from the goats. And so he's saying, I haven't been sent to do that now. I'm not here to judge the world, but the world may be saved through him, through me. That's what Jesus is saying. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is a judgment. That the light has come to the world and men love the darkness rather than the light for their deeds for evil. And he's talking to a man that came to him by night so he wouldn't be seen. Think about it. What, how, he, how Nicodemus is hearing this. For everyone who does evil, th does evil hates the light, does not come to the light for fear that his deeds may be exposed. Nicodemus, you didn't come to me in the daytime. You didn't come when everybody could see you come. Now, this has a much bigger meaning than that, but I'm saying Nicodemus has to be thinking of that too. I would be. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as being, being brought about by God. Now, let's go over to 2 Peter. Chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. Verse 3, Peter said, first, know first of all that in the last days mockers will come with their mocking. They're following after their own lust and saying, where is the promise of his coming? 
For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning. Everybody's been saying things are going to change. The Lord's going to come. Never happened. For, for when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago. And the earth was formed out of water and by waters and through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. But by his word, the present heavens and the earth are being preserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you because he doesn't want any one of you to perish, but for all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be burned up. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of, the, of God, because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat. But according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found in him in peace, spotless and blameless. In regard to the patience of our Lord as salvation, regard it as salvation. Now let's go over to chapter 2. What must I do to remain saved? And can you fall away? And you can fall away. 2 Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse 20. For if after they escape the defilements of the world by the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, then they are again entangled in them, that is the things of the world, and are overcome the last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn away from the holy commandment handed on to them. It has happened to them according to the, tr to the true proverb, a dog returns to its own vomit and a sow after washing returns to wallowing in the mire. So Jesus warned about Lot's wife. Remember Lot's wife. Don't look back. When God calls you out of Sodom, don't look back. When he calls you out of the world, don't look back. When he calls you out of immorality or greed or unforgiveness or whatever it happens to be, don't look back. He calls you out of this world. Don't look back. First John chapter 2. How do we remain saved? Well, notice... Verse 3, by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Obviously, we will be keeping his commandments. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And he says, verse 4, the one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. Now, I would venture to say most people don't think that they're lying when they say they have come to know him. They've come to know something, you see, but they have not come to know the Lord in truth. You, the first thing you do is repent from disobedience. Amen? We have gone the way of rebellion. We have rebelled and disobeyed God. We've gone our own way. We said, look, I'm not following your course for my life. I'm going to set my own course. And you know you're stupid enough to think that you actually can set your own course when you're just really being a puppet of the devil. That's all. He's infinitely more wiser than you are and has you manipulated and wrapped around his little finger. The first humans were wise. They were perfect. There was no nothing fallen about their nature. Their mind, they were geniuses. But they fell to the devil. And God recorded that for us. And he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul said, look, you Corinthians, I'm worried about you. I'm jealous for you. I'm afraid 
that the serpent with his craftiness will deceive you like he deceived Eve. And you'll believe in another Jesus, another spirit, a different gospel. You'll receive it. He was worried about the Corinthian church. So we have to be on guard and be on guard for each other as well. Paul was on guard for the Corinthian church. Paul's on guard for us right now. What he said to the Corinthians applies to us today. By this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. The one who says I've come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. So we have to ask ourselves, how do we know that we love God? Uh, You know, the Lord knows who loves him. We find that in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. How does he know who loves him? Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. He who keeps my, my commandments is he who loves me. If you abide in me, you will keep my commandments. John chapter 15. So that's what he's saying here. He said, and then he goes on to say, Beloved, I'm not writing a new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is a word which you have heard. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 that what matters is keeping the commandments of God. So we must never be deceived into thinking that we don't need to keep the commandments of God. What do we must do to remain saved? Be obedient. Walk obediently before the Lord. Here in John chapter 3, notice verse 4, everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness. And sin is lawlessness. Or in the King James and some others it said sin is a transgression of the law. Lawlessness, transgression of the law, same thing. You you know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. What do we find in, I just quoted in John chapter 15, he who keeps my commandments abides in me and my Father, and we will abide in him. He's saying, if you keep my commandments, if you walk, if see, that's fellowship, that's unity. That's saying, okay, I'm, I'm following you, Lord. I'm not expecting you to follow me. No one who abides in him, verse 6, sins. No one who sins has seen him or knows him. Now, when we're talking about sin here, we're talking about practicing sin. Little children make sure no one, and we know that because chapter 1 tells us that we are to pray to confess our sins before the Lord. So God, and he says if we say that we don't sin, we're a liar. That's what he says in chapter 1. So he's not saying, uh, you know, that you will never commit a sin. This is talking here about practicing sin as a way of life. No one who abides in him sins or practices sin. No one who sins has seen him or knows him. Let's see. And that's connected with lawlessness. And that goes with chapter 2 where we just read, you don't know him if you don't keep his commandments. Little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. And the one who practices sin is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. Realize, chapter 4 tells us what sin is, lawlessness. So if you practice lawlessness, you're of the devil. Who sinned from the beginning, he was lawless. He's, the Antichrist is called the lawless one. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. So little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil was sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose to destroy the works of the devil. And no one who is born of God practices sin because his seed abides in him and he cannot sin or he cannot practice sin. You'll be convicted of it because he is born of him. By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. Verse 18, little children, let us not love with word or tongue 
or with tongue, but in deed and in truth. We will know by this that we are of the truth and we will assure our heart before him and whatever our heart condemns us. For God is greater than our heart and he knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God and whatever we ask, we receive from him. Why? Because we keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing in his sight. And we'll conclude with Philippians chapter 2. Beginning in verse 12. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. That just simply means to guard it, to put a guard or, uh, on your salvation, which is a free gift from God. But it's something that we maintain. It's just like God kindling the fire of the altar. It's the priest's job to keep the fire fueled and fed. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So do all things without grumbling or disputing, so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent children of God, above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you appear as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I will have reason to glory, because I did not run in vain, nor toil in vain. But even if I'm being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I rejoice. And share with my joy with you all. You too, I urge you, rejoice in the same way and share your joy with me. Michael. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day that we have been given another day in your presence, Lord, and we thank you for your word that we can, we can hear and we can receive, that we can put our faith in. Father, I just pray that it would, that it would be useful to us, that we would receive it and we would believe how it is that you love us and who we are in your sight and in your hands and why we're here. Thank you, Lord, for all the things that you provide. Thank you for this time that we have together to fellowship and to eat together. Lord, we ask your blessing on the meal and, and on those that have prepared it. And we just we pray that you continue with us. And thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.